All right. Well, my name is Jonathan Steele, and uh, I was a Guardian leader, writer, and reporter um, at the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s when Ruth asked me to join her in writing a book about Western investment in apartheid. And uh, <clears throat> one of the motivations was that there had been a lot of activity in the late 60s about sports and boycotting South African sports because obviously the teams there were not chosen on a non-discriminatory basis and uh, everything was segregated, including sports. And in um, 1964, actually, South Africa was expelled from the Olympic Games movement because it uh, had racial segregation. But in 1968, uh, it was on the point of being brought back in. The International Olympic Committee wanted to bring South Africa back in and uh, people were incensed around the world and there was a huge campaign and uh, to block South Africa's re-entry to the Olympic movement and it worked. That was 1968. Then in 1969, the South African rugby team, the Springboks, came to Britain and of course it was a completely all-white team and they represented uh, South Africa and there were huge demonstrations, people running onto the pitch and disrupting the matches and it was a, pretty much a disaster for the South Africans. And then as a result of that, the cricket tour, which was supposed to come in 1970, was, was called off, basically. So that was all very important in, in a, as a sort of psychological, political tool in raising awareness around the world about apartheid and in, in inflicting a small symbolic blow against the South African white population uh, on behalf of you know, Africans. But Ruth was... Uh, concerned that um, you know this was missing the main point. I mean, the two real problems for Africans were not to do with the fact that they couldn't play rugby or cricket and join the international team, the national team. Um, she wanted to, but she wanted to use the activism and the heightened um, interest in South Africa to focus on what she felt was the main issue, which was the economy, because the real injustice of apartheid was on the economy. And, and so she um, she invited me and the Christopher Gurney, who was at that time the editor of Anti-Apartheid News, to join her in writing this, this campaigning book. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it was designed to be very well researched, but uh, to be clearly campaigning. And we used to meet in their house in uh, Lime uh, Street in uh, Camden. <coughs> and uh, a lot of sessions were discussing. There was no email, of course, at that time, so we couldn't just send drafts of chapters to each other by email. You know, you had to have come with your typewritten. Uh, paper and uh, we'd discuss it and change and this and that and the other. And there was a lot of fun and a lot of laughter because Ruth was incredibly lively, vibrant sort of personality, interested in gossip as well as everything else. Uh, but if, when it came to sort of her academic and journalistic work, she was deadly serious and committed. And uh, I came here is the book, by the way, um, the South African Connection: Western Investment in Apartheid. I was just looking at it before this interview a few days ago came across this wonderful passage where she was talking about um, the various restrictions on African labour and movement and so on. And she said there's an abundant literature on this issue, some of it serious and well documented. <laughs> I thought, gosh, you know, we're going to have to be really focused, nothing facile, nothing shallow, nothing simplistic. This has to be really proper document, but it's written with a huge moral sort of campaign. And it's, force sort of behind it. She called it the book an indictment. She said this is an indictment of Western capitalism and Western companies. And I think there were sort of three points she really wanted to get across. Um, one was that uh, apartheid wasn't just something that had been constructed by the Afrikaners, by the Boers, that this was something in which English-speaking South Africans were completely uh, involved, uh, in, you know, inseparably part of it, and of course, not just English-speaking South Africans, but uh, their friends in the boardrooms in Britain, uh, in English companies which were investing their money into South Africa to take advantage of the, of the low wages. So that was one of the points to say this idea that somehow, you know, English-speaking South Africans are more liberal and nicer, more decent people, and it's really just the fault of the Afrikaners. That was completely wrong. Uh, a second point was she wanted to make clear that. Um, apartheid was a system of forced labour, slave labour, if you like, almost. Because uh, uh, she, she said that African so have, have 
always been, are now, and probably always will be part of the economy. And they, you can't get away from that. Uh, but they're there as cheap labour. Uh, the whole point of apartheid is to keep Africans in a position of, of total subjection uh, and available for labour in the mines, the farms, whatever it was, the industry. Um, and the third point, and perhaps the most important point, was that um, there was an argument going on at that time, promoted, of course, by business people, uh, that uh, apartheid is irrational. It doesn't make sort of economic sense. It's some kind of ideological uh, product of racism. <clears throat> and as an economy becomes more sophisticated, more developed, apartheid will sort of wither away because it's, uh, it's unrealistic. Um, and she wanted to point out that this was, again, wrong, because uh, if it's a system of forced labour, business people, it's much better for them. They get uh, lower wages, they get a compliant labour force which cannot join trade unions, which has no labour rights of any kind. Um, and uh, you know, only whites could join the trade unions, only they had some kind of collective bargaining. Africans were not allowed to join any trade unions. Um, but th there was this argument that because there's a shortage of white labour <clears throat> and as an economy grows, it obviously has to employ more people. Because of the shortage of white labour, um, employers would have to take on Africans and that would therefore give Africans a chance to get trained and better skills and higher wages and so on. That was meant to be the sort of argument. <clears throat> and it was a kind of no-lose situation, a win-win argument for the, Afri for the business community that corporate sort of structures because they, they can say, well, the more we invest, the more we employ Africans, the more we're undermining apartheid, and, uh, and, and so everything's there, you know, <clears throat> what's the problem? Um, and I, I, we found, using research that had done by others, but some of it our own, that there was something called the floating colour bar. There was, a, there was a sort of glass ceiling above which Africans couldn't be promoted, but as time went on, it just went it got higher, so that if employers didn't have enough labour for sort of skilled jobs in the mines, for example, be mine foremen as opposed to just the people who were holding the pickaxes, um, and they had to employ blacks, <clears throat> and then they would move the whites who had previously been acting as foremen up to a higher category of management. Uh, you'd have blacks coming in as foremen, but you'd pay them less than when the same job was being done by a white person. So it was wonderful for you capitalists, because they got the same work done for less pay. They were terrific. So the, as the flu, Calabar floated upwards, great for the, the business owners and employers, um, did a little bit of good for a few Africans, but it didn't actually undermine the segregation of the races or apartheid in general. So we really had to, felt we had to knock that argument and, and, uh, we, 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 and we used this, these facts that I've just been talking about to show that, uh, that the Calabar just floated, it didn't disappear. Um, and that really the only way to bring down apartheid was to disinvest, to get out and, and to, 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 to withdraw capital and, and change the entire system. And uh, that's what this book was really trying to do. Just wondering, is that how you first encountered Ruth first? Do you remember when you first met her? Yeah, no, no, she, she, she had the idea of the book and <clears throat> she was looking around for somebody to, to work uh, on it. And I'd actually been to South Africa in 1969-1970. Um, I had my own South African connection, which was that I'd just married a South African. And we went out to Cape Town and uh, Johannesburg to, to meet her parents. And uh, while I was there, I was already on The Guardian, as I mentioned. I wrote some articles uh, called, in a sort of series called The Other South Africa, <coughs> which was explaining you know, a lot of stuff about how Africans were exploited, particularly in in the workplace and were being dispossessed of land and pushed out into the into the uh, felt, you know, and just dumped. There was this whole business of <coughs> black spots, they were called, on white farms. There might be a few blacks living, and under the apartheid rules that was impossible, so the blacks were just lifted off, the forced off um, the white farms and just dumped in the open prairie, as it were, you know, the felt. Um, so there was a lot you could write about, and I wrote about that, and I think as, as a result of that, I uh, was read the stuff that I'd written and asked me whether I would uh, yeah. collaborate on the book with her. Were you aware of her work before? 
Yes, no, no, she was in exile, and I hadn't read her stuff mm. that she'd written in South Africa. <clears throat> in journalist, just, you know, she was a journalist there, writing a lot of newspaper articles about labour conditions and so on, <clears throat> particularly in the rural areas. Um, uh, but I didn't have really access to that. <clears throat> but it was her book, 117 Days, which I read, and that was the thing that really first, you know, I heard about her, read about her, learned about her. I guess on a more personal level, do you, what kind of memories do you have of, of working with her in her house? And well, as I say, we spend quite a lot of time there. <clears throat> Nowadays, if you were doing a, a collaboration with somebody, you, a lot of it would be just done by, well, it would have been done by fax about 20 years ago and then by email now. <clears throat> in those days, it was all typewriters. So we had a lot of meetings and Christabel was there and, you know, over coffee and stuff, we would sort of fresh out chapters and decide who was writing this and who was writing that and then rereading what else had written and you know making adjustments and corrections and things. And it was always very fun. I had terrific fun. I always looked forward to it because it wasn't just a, a business thing, you know, sort of solemnly sort of reading stuff, but it was, there was always a lot of joking and fun and laughter and whatnot. Did the three of you generally share a perspective, I mean, obviously, broadly, you shared the same perspective on Well, we shared story. the same idea, because Christabel was editing at Hippata News, which was a mm -hmm. campaigning thing, uh, and I was just, uh, still on The Guardian. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would, after that trip, I wasn't really able to go back to South Africa because for some years, because of what I'd written um, in, the, in that series that I wrote. <clears throat> Were there debates amongst the three of you about how to approach the, the topics? Not really. I mean, I think we all agreed on the line and uh, we didn't have any sort of arguments about that. No, it was more a question of sort of who does what and where we, you know, we need research on this, we need some data on that. Um, and uh, we need to sort of interview uh, business leaders in London uh, about what their attitude is. To, so I went to talk to some of these corporate, corporate sort of bosses what they were doing, which had to be slightly um, subterfuge in a way you didn't explain really quite what that it was, it was for a book, it was more doing this for The Guardian, because I think if they'd known that I was doing something with Ruth first, they might have um, been more leery. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you stay in contact with Ruth? Do you remember when you... Yeah, well then she went off a few years later to uh, Mozambique. Mm -hmm. So, and, and she was then she was in Durham for a time, Durham University. Although she still, you know, came down to London quite a bit. So I would see her at these kind of meetings, campaigning meetings, and solidarity meetings. <coughs> you know, when the Portuguese colonies achieved their independence, there were lots of meetings and things. In fact, just before that, to sort of push it forward, uh, and she was always very active then on the 